So this is a slide I found from uh, Santa Ana Pueblo in New Mexico. And I thought it was perfect because it has all of their Indian words for the different parts of the hydrologic cycle. So when people think that maybe we didn't know about groundwater or we didn't know about different aspects, here it shows, you know, we have transpiration, condensation, the transport of water, you know, precipitation, you know, runoff, you know, uh, infiltration into the ground, the flow of groundwater, you know, uh, how the water flows underground, you know, plant uptake. So it shows all of the different aspects of the hydrologic cycle in their uh, kerosene language. Uh, and so I think it's really important for people to understand that Indians understood all of these different concepts. It's not like we're suddenly saying we have a right to groundwater. You know, we've known about groundwater. Uh, and it was really interesting because when I did all of these Navajo videos on different aspects of nature, I was able to show that, for example, I looked at the Audubon Society list of birds for this region. Navajos have every single one of those birds in their stories. We were very cognizant of our environment and we have words and names to express it. Okay, and so this is just explaining that this is a diagram from their tribe into the Karasan language, uh, including all of these terms in their language for you know, precipitation and evaporation, etc. The rivers and water basins in the lower 48 have been here for millions of years. You know, and this is you know, a map of those uh, water basins. We as a species, we've only been here 25,000 years or less, and yet we have greatly interrupted these waterways. Very important to understand that indigenous people had an understanding of water and how it worked uh, prior to all of the colonial period. There were mega droughts in the lower 48 in the 1100s and in the 1300s. And I think it impacted our world view. We had an understanding that we passed down in our oral tradition. And my brother used to laugh all the time because he would say that my mother would take a bath in a thimble full of water. You know, we had an understanding of the importance and scarcity of water and the need to conserve its use. And that was evident to me as a child. We'd take a bath in a you know, round metal tub and all of us would use the same water. You know, water was scarce. It wasn't something you know, readily available. And so we were... Five little boys, that's what we did. Same bath, water. <laughs> okay. Um, and so the scarce water resources on the planet, we have to address that there are different entities that have rights to those waters. You know, for example, the Rio Grande from you know, Mexico to Texas, there's a, a compact addressing how you know, that water is allocated between the states and there's a treaty as to how it's allocated between Mexico and the United States. So there's a whole legal realm regarding water. And it's international, it's federal, it's state, and it's tribal. Water rights are formalized through stream system adjudications. What happens is that a case is filed in state court because it was decided that states would adjudicate these. Under the McCarran Amendment in 1952, it allowed state courts to also adjudicate Indian water rights. So they're filed in state court. They involve all the water users on a designated stream system within the state boundaries. They apply federal and state law. They take extensive technical work and time. They can take decades. And it's extremely expensive because you have so many parties, private parties, along these waterways that have rights. And if you are going to adjudicate and affect their rights, you have to join them as parties. And so, you know, Congress passed the McCarran Amendment in 1952, under which state courts, you know, could hear Indian reserve water rights cases. Tribes were kind of leery of having state courts adjudicate their rights, so they preferred to nego have negotiated settlements because, you know, it's a, a less hostile environment. You can address so many different things in settlements that might not be addressed in an adjudication. 
And why, why should we even care about Indian water rights? Number one, we have an incredible population growth going on in the arid west. So there are going to be competing uses for the water. We have agricultural uses, industrial uses, oil and gas uses. Shale requires an incredible amount of water you know, to uh, produce it, the, the oil and gas from the shale. Mining uses. Water's needed for economic development. What if Indians want water for a casino, you know, for a golf course, you know, for other economic development purposes? We need to be able to have access to yeah, water. I think one of the other things, too, is that most people don't understand that marijuana growth now uses about 10% of the total amount of water that's used in the United States. Mm -hmm. And it also contributes up to 20% of pollution. Yeah, it's very important. There's going to be a lot of hemp growth and you know other issues going on down the road. It's it's something to be considered uh, for the future. Indian water rights that were not raised legally until the 1900s, uh, and so we were left out of the allocation equation when a lot of the agricultural policies were being developed by the United States government. And really, it wasn't until the 1960s that we actively started getting into quantifying and adjudicating our water rights. So an over allocation of water had occurred in the western states by the time we even started getting involved. You know, uh, senior water users who had an earlier right to water would have the right to that water over later users. So we had a problem of over allocation. We also have a problem of water stress in the western states. And this is where many tribes are located. You know, we have overdrafts of aquifers. We have depletion going on of aquifers. We have droughts in many of the western states, you know, affecting the availability of water. We have climate change, you know, that we're all aware of and we read about every day. And it is expensive and time consuming to adjudicate or settle your water right issues. And I have some uh, diagrams that I think are real important. This is one uh, done by the Bureau of Reclamation uh, showing you know, we're going to have water conflicts you know, between countries, between states, between the federal government, and between Indian tribes. It's going to occur because of the clash with growing population and climate change and the needs of endangered species, uh, water for you know, parks, et cetera. But uh, this kind of shows, a, it's a map kind of identifying potential water supply conflict areas by 2025. And a lot of Indian tribes are located in these areas. It's interesting that Houston area is, yes. is in that. It's right on the Gulf, you know? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. no. Okay, and here's again another map of the water stress areas in the yeah. western United States, and the darker brown, the darker the stress is occurring on the water supply in that area. Again, we're talking about competing uses. And I looked at the population of the metro areas yesterday and put in those numbers. You know, not looking just at the city, because if we think of just the city, we're not going to get the full impact. But we're talking Los Angeles having 13 million people, Las Vegas 2.2 million, Denver 3 million in the greater metro area, Albuquerque a million, Salt Lake 1.2 million, Oklahoma City. We're talking an incredible amount of growth occurring in these urban areas. And that isn't going to change. It's going to continue. Uh, we had interstate water compacts in the American West occurring outside of involving Indian tribes in those allocations. And these were occurring starting in the late 30s, the 40s, the 50s, you know, between the states carving up, you know, how much water each of them was going to get from the streams. Colorado's very important in this equation because seven major rivers have their headwaters in this state. We don't get to claim all of that water, though. We have to you know, enter into compacts with other states, uh, with other governments, to decide how, it, how much water do we get as it's flowing through our state. We, don't get, we can't use it all up. 
We have to allow enough as it's going through New Mexico, as it's going through Texas, as it's going into the Gulf of Mexico, as it's going to Mexico. We can't just use all of the water. There are different agreements in place regarding how that water is allocated. Very important to consider that there are tribes in the Colorado River Basin that also need access to that water. And most of them do not have agreements with the government as to how much water they have or how it's going to be accessed. Uh, it was reported in 2019 that the Colorado River's managing guidelines expired in 2026, but the negotiations for that new agreement have started now. The Colorado River Indian tribes were not included in the 2007 guidelines negotiation. We were not at the table. And so- um, are, we, are we now? I hope we're going to be, because those Colorado Indian tribes have rights to 20% of all the water in the Colo River Mountain in the watershed. And these are the member tribes in the upper and in the lower basin. You know, I'm not going to go through them, but you know, if you want them, I can send it to you. I can send this PowerPoint to you. But very important to know, you know that the state leaders, the water agencies, the farm groups, the environmentalists, the recreational interests, all of those parties are involved. And so uh, we, uh, the Colorado River Tribes, need to get engaged in that process. If you have questions anywhere along the way, please feel free. Um, I mentioned the Navajo Nation. I'm Navajo, so I'm still concerned, you know, obviously, about anything impacting our nation. Almost the size of West Virginia, 300,000 enrolled members. You know, uh, and I loved this, this uh, slide I found. You know, uh, here's this woman on her horse saying, no water for us. You know, no water for the hay, no electricity for us. I like this dog, I'm thirsty. You know, and uh, the engineers said half with the R's. And uh, this is great for Western cities like Los Angeles. Yeah, Arizona now has a great water and power resource. You know, and uh, I thought this was a, a great slide, you know, showing the problems. 40% of Navajos living in one area have no access to running water. So this woman and other volunteers drive their tankers and deliver clean water. And 250 homes on her route. And I thought it was really good. I, I really liked the Navajo basketball series that was on, I think it was on Netflix. Uh, yeah, you saw it. Yeah. And yeah, what were they doing? <laughs> Hauling Hall water. water. Oh, yeah. You know, it's not something that was being done in the past. It's being done today. I thought that movie was really good because it showed a lot of the current uh, environmental and economic issues affecting the people because we would see these families. You know, the basketball players had to get up in the morning, go and haul the water, get on to school, play basketball, get home. Very, that very... Basketball or nothing, that was a good series. Yeah. It was really yeah, a good series. I highly recommend it. Uh, and also, we have aquifers. That's the groundwater, you know, underlying, you know, the earth. You know, we have these porous areas of gravel or sand or silt, and, you know, water is stored in those areas. We have groundwater overdrafts in the United States, again, affecting tribes because look at the areas. You know, and these are overdrafts that have occurred, you know, where we're, we're pulling the water out faster than it can be replenished, faster than rain and snow can, you know, seep into the earth and recharge those aquifers. We're overusing them. And so these, the areas in red are high overdrafts, uh, yellow is moderate, and then minor are not. But again, you can, you know, see the areas that are impacted, especially with the high you know, overdrafts, that's you know, our, our homeland right there. It's an important issue also for Southern California Indian tribes. And there's a lot of them. And the reason it's important is because of the drought conditions and also the irrigation. 
I was in California, and really it was very, I had never gone, uh, you know, to the areas and seeing all of the farming that's going on and everything else. It was really interesting to me because water is so scarce that they are now regulating it. I mean, it was incredible to see the farming. It's to the drop. You know, they have it measured to the drop for the different crops of what's required. You know, I saw tomatoes growing and, you know, other vegetables growing and the irrigation systems that are being used for that farming. And it's all computerized. It's to the drop. The other thing I didn't know about a lot of the uh, genetically modified organisms and seeds that they're using in California for farming, there's a reason. All the tomatoes come out the same size. And you can now mechanically harvest this. So I hadn't realized that one of the reasons for all of the GMO crops is to make it easier uh, in the harvesting process. That instead of having people you know, pick them, you could have machines do it because they're of uniform size. Another well, thing too, GMO um, are, they're actually designed for drought resistance. You know, so that they, they actually grow with less water. Yes. Yeah. So again, we have water stress and irrigated land in California and a tremendous amount of agriculture going on in California, along with the need for population uses. Again, groundwater depletion in California so that you can see what's occurring. I mean, we're talking about 2002 to 2014. You know, of the depletion of groundwater. So if it's depleted and tribes now want access to water, how are they going to go about doing that? Um, we have, I talked about earlier about you can either adjudicate your water rights to determine how much water you have as a tribe, you know, uh, what uses it can be put to, etc. Tribes have preferred to use settlements, though, because uh, it's not as a lengthy of a process. The Department of Interior is heavily involved, uh, and so they have been going the route of settlements. Since 1978, though, you know, we're talking you know, 30 years, 50 years here, we have 36 Indian water rights settlements with 40 individual Indian tribes. How many tribes do we have in the United States that need to have their water rights determined. <laughs> and of these, 32 were approved and enacted by Congress. And the reason that's important is those 32 required money. If it's going to involve money to settle the water rights of tribes, because you have to provide a mechanism for delivering the water to tribes, and that can be very expensive you're going to need congressional approval because it's going to involve spending of federal money, federal funding. And the other four were administratively approved by Justice and Interior because they didn't require an expenditure of federal funds. And so the federal government's involved because of its trust responsibilities. So here we have the tribes that do have uh, Indian water rights settlements, you know, 40 of them, uh, and then, uh, you know, the federally recognized tribes are shown in gold, and the ones with settlements are shown in red. It doesn't mean that all of the issues have been settled, but they do have settlement agreements. $3.5 billion to date has been authorized uh, for Indian water rights settlements, and that's involving you know, projects needed to construct and operate delivery systems. Very important. But the problem is the funding sources are drying up from the federal government. And again, so they're trying to figure out different ways, uh, funding through additional mechanisms, redirection of funds, you know, by the federal government. And again, we are a low priority. We are 1% of the population. We don't have a lot of representatives you know, in the, the in Congress. You know, now we have luckily you know, Representative Halen and the other representative, I forgot her name right off hand. But uh, we don't have a lot of representation fighting for us. Uh, there's currently pending litigation of Indian water rights involving about 50 Indian tribes 
in 12 states. There are many more requests of different tribes to the Department of the Interior to try and adjudicate their water rights. So it's something you know that's ongoing. And the problem with this is you have to you practically dedicate your whole life. It takes you know, a lot of these cases can take 15 years to resolve. So as an attorney, you're going to be involved long term. And it requires a tremendous amount of expertise to determine, you know, um, you know, for example, practically irrigable acreage is a standard many courts use to determine how much water tribes should get. So you've got to determine the arable land base, uh, what crops can be grown on that land base, how much water is used to grow those crops, etc. So a lot of technical expertise is required. And a lot of that expertise is not available within tribes today. So it has to be through the Department of the Interior or through hiring you know, professionals that have that type of expertise. Closing the water access gap, and again, this is just a report done in November 2019, closing the water access gap in the United States. You know, reports that more than two million Americans live without these conveniences, and Native Americans are more likely to have trouble accessing water than any other group. Why don't tribes have sovereign right to use water? How come we can't just go out and drill wells and access water from rivers. And again, it's because you know, the doctrine of discovery, we're domestic dependent nations, we're under the control of the federal government, we're subject to federal law. But, 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 again, you know, resulted in the death dispossession, and we discussed this last time. The five civilized tribes are different. They are unique. You may have been removed and had to march on the Trail of Tears, but you've got something that most other tribes did not. You've got fee simple title to your land, and that includes your right to water. The, uh, the land that was set aside for you know, uh, Indian tribes in Oklahoma, it was never part of an organized territory of the United States. It was never part of a state. So your uh, reservations were not carved out of the state of Oklahoma. The state of Oklahoma did not exist. There was not a federal Oklahoma territory that existed. Your reservations were not carved out of a federal territory or a state. They were set aside um, for a homeland for relocated tribes. So your title is very unique. The intent was to grant, and it's in your treaties, fee title to your lands. Uh, and you know, no, it's in, it's in your treaties also, and I'll show you in a minute. No organized federal territorial government or state could ever include the fee land that had been granted to you, nor could it include jurisdiction over that fee land. Accordingly, in 1907, when Oklahoma was granted statehood, it disclaimed any state interest in tribal property. So that this. is your land. Because you guys are members of the five civilized tribes. We don't have these simple titles. Uh, Navajos have the right of occupancy to their land. Well, Do you think some of my family members still own that land over there in Oklahoma where my grandparents lived at? I have a map of their land, but I don't know who owns it. You can do a genealogical research and determine, you know, uh, your family history and how that impacts yeah, your, how rights, that your rights today. I just don't it, know how that. It happens. has to stay within your family. So somebody so in has, your family, family has to pass that land out. If at any point they sell that land, uh, 
if you're done. It's sold. Um, you can't go back and say, oh, wait, this is my land by treaty, by Dawes Act. Is that because of water rights, mineral rights? Most, yeah, yeah, most people land. sold their land because of the fact there was oil on it. Yeah, because over there, over there in Grove, my grandparents, my, uh, I think it was my great great, my great grandparents, or their mom and dad, they were like some kind of big, involved with some kind of big bank over there, and yeah, they were like the most wealthiest people in that area. And when I did my genealogy to some people that, so I'm real connected with the people in Oklahoma and the tribal, our tribal over there. Talked about people over there, and they were showing me like the map of all the land on my family over there, but I just don't know who owns that land now. That's what I was wondering how you find out who owns that land. The, the, the state has all that information. The state does? Yeah. With the nation? Uh, the nation has some of it, but it's only, the nation only has that which is actually, you know, associated with the nation now. In the original allegations. So, but the it's state. Just like now, in the county. Records if you yeah, but you can go back. You can go to the nation and find out what the original allocations were. That's where I got it from. So I was over there. And then from there, you can go to the state. The state will provide you with the tenancy records of whoever occupies that land now. Yeah, because that's there. And if you got family there, you can go back and say, hey, this guy got family all over. Just that specific area, I was wondering if that's a big piece of land. So you can go to the county records and figure out who's who has title to that land. Yeah. It's recorded somewhere. Believe yeah, me, taxes. every piece of land in this country, there is a record of who owns it. Somebody must own it. It cannot be unowned at any time. Treaties with the five civilized tribes, the treaties with the Cherokees, the Choctaws, the Chickasaws, you'll see in a minute. You have the United States here by covenant and agree that the land ceded to the Cherokee Nation in no future time without their consent will be included within the territorial limits of any state or territory. Again, with the Choctaws, you know, no ter territory or state shall ever have the right to pass laws for the government of the Choctaw Nation of the Red People and their descendants and no part of land granted them shall ever be embraced by any territory or state. Well, let's continue. The Choctaws, I mean the uh, Chickasaws and Creeks, again, you know, it's, it's, uh, they have a fee simple title to their land. So no land or water rights in the land granted to these tribes pass to the state or to the federal government. Now then how it worked with the other states is for example, you know, a territory would have been set up originally by the federal government, you know, for, for example, the state of Mississippi, you know, and then it is uh, when the, there would have been a territory and then eventually they would have been admitted to the Union as a state. When they were admitted to the Union as a state, the state would have the right to allocate the water within the state boundaries. Now then, since the title was vested in the five civilized tribes prior to the state of Oklahoma being granted statehood, there's no federal trust applied to the water in your lands or state, so it's your water. So tri the five civilized tribes retain ownership and governmental authority over their waterways. And there's a reason, there's, you know, uh, Indian ter territory was never intended to be a state. There's unmistakably clear language in your treaties that you have fee simple title uh, there's no governmental authority over your lands. There's uh, no language in the Oklahoma Enabling Act or other statutes that divested you of that right. Things happened already. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but in 2005, Senator, Republican Senator James Inhofe of Oklahoma added a rider to a transportation bill. It's a midnight hour 
you know, making it illegal for tribes residing within Oklahoma to operate environmental protection programs without first negotiating with the state government. And it passed. So if, if any of the five civilized tribes want to receive Environmental Protection Act uh, you know, certification to operate their own Oklahoma environmental programs, they have to get an agreement with the state of Oklahoma, and that's never going to occur. So it makes it difficult for, for tribes to deal with off-reservation pollution by non-Indians, even though it may impact the reservation, because you can't get treatment as a state certification to operate your environmental protection program. You know, and really, that's really a violation of those treaties. It is. And I don't know, I mean, maybe, I'm hoping that, you know, the tribes of Oklahoma get together and sue the federal government and say, hey, you violated that treaty, right? I mean, I, I love that the Chief Hoskin right now is really going after the government on, yes. you know, getting, being uh, responsible and living up and having the integrity to live up to this, the verbiage of what the, the uh, you know, treaties say. I, but this really bugs me. You know, and you, wonder, you wonder why all the Indians are Democrats. Um, you know, this is why. But it, uh, the runoff's a big deal, and it's affecting groundwater stuff. You know, like my dad's even his wells and stuff are because of runoff from poultry. Uh, okay, poultry that's the next stuff. slide, Daddy. Yeah, that's that's a big thing. They're putting on all these poultry things. Here we go. And that sense too. I mean, his his water used to be pristine, and you now it's yeah. nasty. This is the phosphorus pollution outside the reservation by non-Indian polluters impacting reservation water. Yeah. It includes lands within the Cherokee Nation boundaries. And according to former Oklahoma Attorney General Edmondson, the Illinois River, River contains phosphorus levels equivalent to waste that would be generated by 11 million people and it currently is on EPA's list of impaired waters for phosphorus wow. loads. What is EPA? The Environmental Protection Agency. Kind of the about pretty complex. Oh, yeah. Well, you did, and then you didn't, and then now you can't get it. Okay. So, again, poultry producers in the Illinois River. So now we're going to go to, okay, so we've talked about your water rights, which are pretty simple title and pretty extensive, but then you have to watch out for what Congress does along the way. And if nobody's fighting this legislation, it can slide through the midnight rider, you know, Senator Inhofe. Okay, so other, other Indian tribes, though, what happened with us is land was reserved for us in either an existing federal territory or an existing state. And so we don't have fee simple title to the land or to the water. We have a, the right of occupancy to the land that is owned by the federal government on our behalf. Do, do they, I mean, I know that, you know, that the Navajo consider themselves to be a sovereign nation, but how can they be a sovereign nation on borrowed land? You know? See, that's a problem. I think that's why a lot of development didn't occur on Indian lands. If you're renting a property, do you make any improvement to it? No. Well, that's what's happening with tribes. We, the majority of tribes, do not own their land. It's owned by the federal government in trust for the tribe. We have the right of occupancy. We're a tenant. And the, uh, so what happened is, you know, the uh, non-Indians that had moved to the West came up with their own water rights system. There was a vacuum, and so they came up with first in time, first in right. Especially it was an issue for miners. You know, they needed water, and they needed to make sure they had enough water for their mining of gold and silver and other uses. So they came up with, you have to beneficially use the water, you have a definite quantity, a definite use, a definite time of use. If you don't use it, it's lost through abandonment. Um, 
and the priority date is when you began. A lot of Colorado water rights go back to the 1800s with the gold mine. It's transferable, and if you have a senior right that goes back to the 1800s, your right is better than someone's right in the 1900s. How does, how does fracking, you know? Oh, fracking? Because that uses huge amounts of water. Huge amount. I just went to a fracking water presentation. I could do one for you down the road. <laughs> But, um, okay, so got water? See that fish? Is they having trouble? <laughs> I, I want to say something. I'm going to go back one. Yeah. Um, fracking's going on in North Dakota, and I was on the Bakken, on the Fort Berkeley Reservation. They, and they are tearing their roads up because of the big trucks yeah. that are going up and down. And I thought it was oil. It's wastewater. It's water that they're trying to put someplace so it doesn't hurt the environment. Well, they'll never do that. Yeah. But, but that's what it is. It's so much yeah. water. A lot of water produced with fracking. So what's yeah. the reclamation process for that? Can they do anything? No. Once they, they just you know, you know, just send it back into formations underground. It's causing all the impacts. Yeah. Re -pump. Re -pump. And some of it leaked. Some of it leaked, and it just it just created havoc on, on the land. Tremendous amount of water requires Sinkholes. for fracking shale. Yeah. Sinkholes and Sinkholes. earthquakes because of plate shifts. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, when you've got oil down there, you know, the plates can slide. But you put water down there, that's friction. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, we're seeing more and more earthquakes, particularly in Oklahoma. Yeah. Right. Going to be something continuing. Let's see what's going on in Taos with the fracking over there. Where? In Taos, New Mexico. No. Over the water. It, there was a friend of mine, because there were a bunch of natives over there that, I don't know if you are aware of it, but there's a protest going on against the people that are trying to take the water away over there in Taos. And uh, one of my friends is one of the local natives over there. He went and climbed to the top of their drill team, and he, he uh, stayed up there for almost like, I think it was like three days, and he even got arrested and everything. Because they're trying to dig out that water out of there and sell the water to some foreign company that, for you know, not, not the water from around, for the people around that area and all the natives. There's a lot of big protests going on over there. You're going to see a slide yeah. late, later that you know, highlights the problems, uh, like for Pickery's Pueblo. Yeah. But um, very important, you know, they say here in Colorado, the saying is that whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. See, we just don't really get into this water issue because we're not farmers. We're not miners. We're not oil and gas companies that need the water. So we just think of it as flowing water and go and turn it on and use it. And something happened in Colorado just in the last 10 years that makes water rights owners in Colorado not want to litigate their water rights. The Colorado Supreme Court held that if you go in and try and litigate the amount of water you were allocated back in the 1800s, the court can cut it back. Because what happened back then is they did not have the technological ability we have today to determine how much water you actually need. So you need less for your agriculture that was allocated to you back in the 1800s. The Colorado Supreme Court, this is private parties, this is not tribes, will cut back your water allocation. So parties are gonna be very hesitant in the state of Colorado to have to look into those old water rights they were granted. And the federal government has, you know, really defers to states to allocate the water within their boundaries. The federal government does have water rights separate from state law for military bases, for Indian reservations, for other uses. But really, they look to the state to allocate the water flowing through the state. Indian reserve water rights were first raised in 1908 in the Supreme Court case of Winters versus the United States. And again, this is for tribes that are unlike the five civilized tribes who have fee simple title. This is for tribes whose reservations were reserved by the federal government in their treaties. So the federal government retains the right and obligation under the Constitution to manage federal lands. 
So they have to be sure that they're watching over the states such that the states and private parties' water uses are not impacting the water they need for federal parks, for military bases, for other uses. So Congress does have a role in this whole thing. But again, the states are the primary player. So we have this conflict going on between the federal government, we want water for our military bases, and you can be assured with the coronavirus, we're gonna be you know, having a lot of military-based water use, you know, uh, and other, you know, and then the state saying, well, we wanna be sure that the private parties that have permits from us for water use, that their rights are protected, you know, that we don't have to cut back their uses during times of shortage, we have tribes saying we didn't get in the game, we want to know how much water we have, we want to be able to use it. And very importantly, tribes have the right to lease water that they have a right to. So if they're not using it, they can lease it to a non-Indian and make money on it. And so, um, very controversial area between these parties. And U.S. agricultural part policy back to the 1800s, it was not concerned with Indian water rights. It was concerned with bolstering agricultural production to expand the nation. So we can't just look at what's happened today. We've got to go back. You know, Lincoln passed the Homestead Act, granting settlers 160 acres, you know, which they would own outright on homesteading it for a particular amount of time or purchasing it at a very low cost. So in order to support all of this agriculture, you know, again, we have the land ordinance of 1875 required states and tribes ceding land west of the Appalachian to Congress, and again, they're parceling it out to settlers. By the end of the 19th century, we have settlement of 80 million acres of farmland you know, in the U.S. Um, we have General Allotment Act, which you're all familiar with, you know, where we lost control of 100 million acres of land or two-thirds of our land base. So we're not talking about their agricultural policy supporting Indian land rights or Indian water rights. This is going on to support the settlement of this country, which was primarily non-Indians. We have the Reformation Act in 1902, constructing and operating dams, reservoirs, canals, a reclamation of the arid western lands. You know, we're talking about an explosive development. The Garrison Dam in North Dakota, you talked about going up to North Dakota. My sons are Dwayne and Aaron Birdbear and they are Man and Hidatsa on their father's side. We were just talking about this gentleman who knows uh, Dwayne Bird there. He passed away when he was 59. I did his biography, it's on the internet, but he had an incredible, uh, incredible, I wanted his grandchildren to know his story, so I put it online, and it's this thick, because luckily I had all the papers that he had written in law school at DU on, um, and you get how Indians should control education, Indians should control their natural resource developments, Indians should control uh, the environment. He had drafted like a environmental code with John Echo Hawk. You know, had all of that, so I put it online so that his grandchildren will know this is who their grandfather was. It is a lot of that information isn't kept. A lot of you don't even know who Dwayne Burger is. He led the takeover of the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Littleton along with Tilly Walker where we occupied the BIA offices for two weeks which led to the case of Freeman versus the United States because the Bureau of Indian Affairs was discriminating against Indian employees at the Littleton BIA office. Look at Eve, who's an attorney, and she's even looking at me like, what are you talking about, Carol? I don't know about it. See, she doesn't, most of you don't even know about it. We were marching around, DJ Birdbear, my son, they have a picture of him as a baby in the director's office where we took over the building because Nola Freeman was an Indian employee with the BIA in Littleton, and she was a clerk. And she kept applying the secretarial positions open because she wanted to be a secretary. So many of the employees in the BIA that were Indians at the time were in the lowest level jobs. The case went up to the Supreme Court. 
Indians received the right to preference from the BIA in promotions and training. And this happened here in Littleton, Colorado. Wow. I have all the pictures online of us marching in front of the Littleton office. Thank you, I have to draw now. Is that on your... It's on the website. A lot of people, see I would like, we need to do a movie of that. We really do. We really do. And the people are dying off. We all what got together. Huh? What year was that? Huh? What year was that? Uh, it was in 1970. In 1970, Brenda Mitchell, who was in that demonstrations, just died six months ago here in Denver. A lot of you probably don't even know. I had a picture of her when she was 18, and she was gorgeous. Well, I was Marching. a senior in high school. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, so now I gave still a kid. family a picture of her, and a pic picture of her when she was 18, marching in this demonstration. And then now she's you know, elderly and had passed away six months ago. And so anyway, um, and then the fun thing about uh, Brenda Mitchell was we were at the, recently at the Redskins demonstration here in Denver when the Washington Redskins were playing the Broncos. We were at the demonstration, so we said, well, we're still going. <laughs> still, but see, a lot of people don't know this stuff. <laughs> I don't know how we're going to make it available because it's our history here in Little Denver. I wish I would have known about that because I'm an activist and I go to a lot of my son just had a march. My son just had a march about a month ago. Dwayne Birdbear, who is a professor at the University of Colorado Denver Center and teaches um, physics, also teaches the Native American experience class. And his students that were all non-Indians in the class, there weren't even Indians taking the class, they were amazed when they learned all this stuff about our history. So they marched down to the Capitol to meet with Governor Polis to tell him, you need to be teaching Indian history in the public school system. Nobody even knows about this stuff. I get, I get asked to go into public schools and do presentations. And it can run anywhere from Cherokee artifacts all the way up to Cherokee history and trail tears and stuff. And I am amazed the lack of information that is exposed, the students are exposed to, and the teacher would come up to me and say, I have no idea. Didn't you go to school? Did you go to college? Did you go to school? And this was not any time. In fact, you know, I don't know all my time growing up, you know, I'm going to get into the identity. You know, I've actually had people come up and say to me, oh, I didn't know that there was any in these lives. Right. 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 When I gave my, I did a presentation, and not all of you were here, but on you know, the Marshall Trilogy and the dispossession of Indian lands. When I talked talk at Dean Law School to the water law students explaining why we didn't have water lines because of the doctrine of discovery and the dispossession of Indian lands, they didn't even know anything about it. And they're law students. They didn't cover it in property law. So again, we have this vacuum going on. But again, let's you have the U.S. government wasn't concerned with us when they're settling the United States and developing all of their agricultural property. Here's George Gillette, who is the tribal chairman of the Mananhidatsa Arikawa Nation, signing away a quarter of their reservation that was flooded due to the Reclamation Act of 1902. He says, we will sign this contract with a heavy heart. With a few scratches of the pen, we will sell the best part of our reservation. Right now, the future doesn't look too good to us. And here he is. Do you see him crying? He's crying. My son did on the reservation. So, Indian water rights, again, were not raised until, until the 1900s. All this agricultural policy is going on in the late 1800s, you know, opening the United States agricultural to manufacturing, to industrial uses, to population growth that's going to affect our need for water. So, this was a case involving Fort Belknap Reservation, located in what would later become uh, Montana. The reservation was created, you know, um, by an agreement in 1888 between the tribes and the U.S. government. 
uh, land was reserved for them so they could become agricultural people versus nomadic. And so we set aside these different reservations. Look at all these different reservations in Montana. My, well, you know. My daughter lived there. Yeah. And so what had happened was on the Milk River, non-Indian defendants had built large dams and reservoirs, canals, ditches, waterways to divert water from the Milk River for their agricultural purposes. That diversion was impacting the water that was available to Fort Belknap Reservation and to the federal government for water. And so the federal government sued these non-Indian defendants. And so, um, again, we have to sue. <laughs> but luckily, the federal government sued. And so uh, the U.S. Supreme Court held that water had been reserved to the Assiniboine and Grovevan Indians on the Fort Belknap Reservation when the land was set aside because it was set aside for agricultural purposes. And without water, the land is valueless. So they held that the federal government did reserve water rights for Bel Fort Belknap Reservation and for a use which would necessarily continue through the years. Indian reserve water rights are really, well, you guys have them, but you know, Indian reserve water rights are very interesting. And again, non-Indians don't like them. Why? Because it's affected by the purposes of the Indian reservation, the date when the Indian reservation was created. Most of them were created in the late 1800s. So these water rights have a very early priority date. Uh, they have to be quantified for water sufficient to fulfill the purposes of the reservation. So many times that's agricultural use, which is a lot of water. Uh, they, they, and the amount has to satisfy the present and future needs of the reservation. Congress had assigned these lands, but it wasn't for a static group of Indians that were living there. It was for a group of people that were going to continue for generations and that were going to need water for those future needs. That's on the date the reservation was set aside. And again, how many tribes do we have that have determined their water rights? That have settlement agreements? How many? 40. 40. Okay, so, and then in 1939, you know, it, they, uh, the Wati sued to determine that they have water rights since the land had been carved up under the General Allotment Act. And the court did help, yes, uh, trust the <coughs> have the right to watch. And again, there's another case uh, in uh, 1983. See, we're not getting into the game, you guys, until late. We're talking 1983, 1990s, 2000. All of this water is already being allocated and used by non-Indians. So the Klamath tribe of Oregon had reserved in their tree the right to hunt and fish outside of the reservation. So they needed water to support the fishing rights to keep the river level at a certain level such that fish could be sustained. So uh, the uh, Ninth Circuit held that they possessed an aboriginal right to water used by the tribe for fishing purposes from time immemorial. So this is another type of water. We have the reserved water under their treaty and we also have an aboriginal right to water. Two different legal types of water rights. Very important. The first is very clear. The second is very murky. And then, huh? See, I'm telling you guys, it's happening. What's this, what's this day? 2019. 2019. Okay, climate tribes again suing the federal government because the water level isn't being maintained in the rivers to sustain their fishing rights. That the sue. <laughs> so again, you know, Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit says, darn right, their treaty says they have fishing rights and the water has got to be at a sufficient level in the river. They have a priority date over other non-Indian agricultural, industrial, private users to sustain that water level. But we've got to sue. 
If we don't sue, forget it. Well, you know, the thing is, you know, we, we only have limited resources. We only have limited money, which is really hard. I mean, the genocide continues to this day. It does. That's why I have the Holocaust Museum. And uh, what the thing that really bothers me is that big groups with big money come in and sue for the rights to take away our rights. And depending on what the climate is at the time, I don't know that we're winning as many cases as we're losing. Oh, no. Narf said, forget about going to courts. Your rights, in the, especially in the recent court history, are not being protected. We are not. We're losing like 80% of the cases no. that we're bringing. So we're not going to receive protection in the court system. This is so angry. And that's just, <laughs> so why do you think I, I did this presentation? <laughs> Do you think I was happy? I'll tell you in a minute. You'll see why I did this presentation. Now, the aboriginal rights, which are murky, it's a whole different area of law, are very important to Indians. Why? Because for fishing. So the Supreme Court has said, yes, water has to be preserved for enough fishing. Agriculture. We've got, you know, we've got life. We've got our livelihoods. Crops. We need crops. We need, we have livestock. We need willow. We need willow growing along the river streams for our basket weaving. It's not a, just a little hobby. Hopis need cottonwood trees to carve the katsinas that are used in their religious ceremonies. Navajos, we need access to different areas off the reservation. We need the right to go and collect rock that we grind into sand that we use in our healing ceremonies. This is an aboriginal right. None of the Navajo's four sacred mountains are on tribal land. Mount Hesperus, Mount Blanca are here in southern Colorado. San Francisco Peaks is in Flagstaff. Mount Taylor is in Grants, New Mexico. Aboriginal rights are not just you know, a loose topic. We need those rights. We need rights to you know, different plants that we use for dyes and our weaving. For, you know, for it's so hard for non-Indians sometimes to understand these are spiritual uses. What about bear deer? Pardon? Bear deer. Pardon? Bear deer. 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 Bear deer